Hello and welcome to the Oakland County Megacast. I'm Tyler Keefe in the studios of 89.3 Lakes FM and Civic Center TV, our flagship stations. As always, we're simulcast on Birmingham Area Municipal Access on Comcast Channel 15 and AT&T Channel 99, as well as 88.1 The Biff out of Bloomfield Hills. In addition today, we're always on Facebook and one of our Facebook partners each and every day via Facebook Live. Today, that partner is the Greater West Bloomfield Chamber of Commerce. And we thank Suzanne Levine and her entire team over there for joining us today on the Oakland County Megacast. And as always, from her home studios in Kego Harbor is Ronnie Dahl. Hello there, Mr. Uh, hello. Tyler. Happy Thursday to you. Do you ever have those weeks where you feel like it's already Friday. I'm like, it's yeah. only Thursday. It kind of does. This has like been it. a long week. It has been a long week. After last week, where I didn't, I didn't have my bearings until it was actually Friday. I didn't know what day was which. After the uh, the holiday last week, Monday. Uh, even though I worked on that day, I worked on that day. You worked on that day. I still had no idea if it was Monday, if it was Tuesday, if it was Friday. This week, it just feels like it feels like it's already coming to an end. But there's still a couple of days left. It's it's been a weird couple of weeks. Uh, yeah. So last week, though, you had work that Saturday because of the football game. Now, will you get the full weekend off this weekend? I do, as of, as of now. We'll see how it works out, but as of now, yes. Well, you deserve a couple days uh, off. Tyler, I will say uh, I chose last night to go to yoga. I found a okay. great new uh, yoga place here in Waterford, um, which means when I say it's a great place, it means it's easy. Uh, <laughs> yoga can be so intimidating. It can, it can, be, very, it can be very tough. Oh, but I managed to get through the class without falling. Uh, loved the teacher. She was great. Uh, but with that, I chose to do that instead of watching the governor's press or her state of the state last night. So I'm sorry to say I missed it, but I have been watching clips throughout the morning. Yeah, I, I've seen some news reports on it, and that pretty much gave me the gist of it. I tuned in for about 30 seconds, and I heard her. I forgot exactly what the phrase is. I could look it up real quick. The Some Latin phrase she said. And then once she said, let's fix the damn road ahead, that's where I was like, all right, you know, that's enough for me. Um, I, I'm checking out here. It's, no, no one's fixing the damn road ahead. You, you, you don't see eye to eye with the Republicans in the state house and, and Senate. They don't see eye to eye with you. Nobody wants to do it. No one has any desire to do it. If you did, you would have already been at, at it. So... Uh, I'll, I'll fix my own damn road ahead and tune out and read read stories on it the next morning. So uh, with that, uh, Tyler, I'll just go ahead and jump into the headlines because that was uh, pretty much the top headline of the day. So if anyone wants to follow along, it's uh, civiccentertv.com. Click on coronavirus, that tab, and that's where you'll find the updated headlines each and every morning. So as you were just saying, the governor urged a move toward common ground with the Republican lawmakers uh, during her third state of the state address as she called for the ending of the COVID-19 pandemic and boosting the economy. And so her speech lasted less than 30 minutes. It was short on criticism, but emphasized working together despite high profile clashes with the Republican lawmakers. As recently as Wednesday afternoon, uh, Whitmer called on the legislator to pass her $5.6 billion COVID-19 relief plan immediately. But so far the Republicans uh, have refuted that plan because the House GOP unveiled its alternative, $3.5 billion. Uh, it included tying $2 billion in education funding to the governor uh, and her handling of her administration's power to close schools and halt sports over to local health departments. They do have an interesting argument there being, Tyler, that you know sometimes our state is so large and so diverse some of these restrictions that are put in place maybe you know shouldn't be made on a state level they should be made on a more local level yeah the, the numbers vary place to place and we saw earlier on in the pandemic when the governor didn't uh, when the governor was making these decisions straight out of her office and not in cooperation with the health and human services department when we had the when we had the phasing system and there are different regions those uh, six regions in the state of michigan that would be in, in different phases of, re, of reopening portions of society or lifting restrictions based on how those general areas were performing with COVID-19 numbers. I think that's what this kind of is, or this kind of goal is. It is something uh, in that alternative that would provide local departments with more 
of that ability to go through their health departments, go through their executive offices, and decide on the local level how to deal with the pandemic while the state office is still dealing with the state on a macro level. And if things do need to be taken into account for the entire state due to rampant spread from one area or another, it can still be addressed at the executive level statewide. So uh, one of the things that's really getting a lot of play right now is the issue and the rally for Let Them Play. Uh, we are going to have a, one of the members, the board members, uh, Mark Hall, with us on a little bit later on the show because they have the big rally coming up on Saturday. And I think people are saying to the governor, if you're making these decisions and you're telling us it's about the science and the data, they're saying provide us with that science and the data. Now she's saying, well, there are a lot of metrics that go into this. So hard numbers maybe don't tell the story. Um, sometimes you got to put them into context. And of course, right now, the big issue being the variant that she is concerned about. So we'll talk to uh, Mark a little bit uh, later in the show. But of course, that is going to be one of the big sticking points uh, between the Republicans and uh, Governor Whitmer and her administration, I think, in the uh, coming days as well. Yeah, it definitely will be. This is continuing to be an issue uh, statewide. It's getting louder and louder from the Let Them Play crowd. Uh, and at some point, the governor and her office are going to have, and the Department of Health and Human Services as well, are going to have to address that uh, on, a, on a greater level than they already have uh, and, and speak on it with a little bit more detail as to why and, to, and why these are being shut down, how things could potentially be reopened and what benchmarks need to be met in order for that to be considered. There's, there's a lot of questions that are being asked of the governor and of the, the Health and Human Services Department, including their new director as well, uh, as winter sports continue to be suspended due to COVID-19. Well, and that's not the other only thing being impacted right now because the University of Michigan has issued a stay at home recommendation. Uh, all students on the University of Michigan's Ann Arbor campus are being told to stay home for the next two weeks. The school asked students to limit their time outside their residence following a recommendation from the county health department. It comes days after the university's athletic department suspended all operations for 14 days to try to slow the spread of the variant strain of the coronavirus. So students are being asked remain at their campus area addresses and to not gather with others out side of their household members. Students are permitted to leave their residence only to participate in limited activities included in in-person classes, work or research that cannot be completed remotely, obtaining food and medical care and other approved activities. All U of M students living on or near campus also are strongly encouraged to participate in free weekly tested testing provided by the university. Uh, you know, the undergrad, undergraduate students living on campus, they are already required to get tested weekly as well. Now, as of Wednesday, there were 14 cases of the highly contagious B117 variant in Washtenaw County. The outbreak traces back to one female student athlete. It's going to be interesting to see if some of these students actually follow along, but the universities uh, here in the state of Michigan are really cracking down on the students if they're caught not abiding by the health department's recommendations. Yeah, they've had these stay-at-home stay recommendations and stay-at-home orders multiple times. Washtenaw County has not exactly had a, such a great time as of late and overall during this pandemic preventing the spread of COVID-19. And so the University of Michigan having to take this even more seriously than they did before and really clamp down on the students and say, listen, if you're not going to participate uh, in, in, in these regulations, if you're not going to follow these pretty simple rules that we've put forth, uh, to prevent further spread of this on our campus, there's going to be serious consequences because uh, they're seeing the spread on their campus become less controllable over time. And they need, especially with the variant being out there and being in Washtenaw County itself, they need to be extra careful on that campus, especially with the number of people that are navigating that campus each and every day. Yeah, so the vaccine is here. People are starting to get the vaccine, but the coronavirus is still here and very much a part of our lives for the foreseeable future. Um, just coming across the news feed right now, Tyler, one of my absolute favorite events, the Detroit St. Patrick's Day Parade has been canceled again 
due to COVID-19, I remember last year I was signed up to do um, the 5K and I remember it being canceled like a day or two uh, prior. And this was back in the beginning. I was like, oh, there's no way people aren't going to come out. Um, but, you know, a lot of people, it, it's been very interesting because so many of those um, bars and restaurants in the Corktown area, they rely on these big events uh, to really see them through for the entire year. And they're continuing to suffer. And now another cancellation. Yeah, yeah the, these are big events for these businesses all throughout our local area and these businesses that see so much come in, whether it be from the Woodward Cruise and those businesses in Birmingham and Royal Oak and Berkeley or uh, those or those businesses downtown during the North American International Auto Show. Those are big times of the year where you know, if they have a slow period of the year, that helps to make up for that and then some and help pad their pockets a little bit. And this year with things being shut down and people being more averse to going out altogether to to businesses and, and especially to restaurants due to the Michigan's health orders, uh, it becomes even more of a problem for these businesses who are trying their best right now to stay afloat. Well, here's a good story um, for us to share with you. Ray's Ice Cream Store raises more than $50,000 in a GoFundMe campaign. So business was so slow over at Ray's Ice Cream in Royal Oak. The 63-year-old shop was forced to launch a crowdfunding campaign this week to stay afloat. Uh, the response was overwhelming. The family-owned business smashed its $50,000 goal in just 24 hours, raising more than $52,000 the majority of the contributions, Tyler, small ones from like five bucks, 10 bucks to up to $250. Um, so the owner said, we are speechless. The amount of love and support we have received in the last 24 hours has been amazing. We love our customers and would not be the community staple that we are if it wasn't for all of you. So with the lack of indoor seating and some of the restaurant closures, the ice cream shop's business has suffered because half a raised ice cream business goes to distributing um, their product to other restaurants while the other half is their retail soda fountain store so it's great to see how the community uh, rallies around some of these staple businesses to keep them in our neighborhoods yeah and it's good to see that when people see a business is struggling as much as race is and especially uh, when it's been something that's been in the Royal Oak community for as long as it has, that they do rally behind them with those small donations and some people that were just being extremely generous. And there's been a rally behind this business throughout the local area in, in the media community and, and through other influencers in the Metro Detroit area that have helped this 63-year-old institution in Royal Oak um, raise enough money to really be able to stay on track and hopefully stay open uh, despite COVID-19 continuing to make a major impact on restaurant businesses all throughout the local area and throughout the country. They have some of the best ice cream too. Uh, like around um, Thanksgiving time, they do a pumpkin pie ice cream. Okay. It is so good. Uh, so I, it's great to have these businesses that have been around for decades um, continuing to uh, stick around. Let's hope at least, you know, because while $50,000 sounds like a lot, really when you're running a business, right that money may not go that far. But, uh, you know, a lot of this money is going to go to help um, meet the payroll for the store there in Royal Oak. So that's the good news for the day. Yeah, good to hear that. Good to hear that it, that, that money is going to be put to good use to help the people that do work at Ray's continue, continue to be able to uh, make some sort of a living despite the business being very much, uh, very much lessened during the course of this pandemic and yeah fifty thousand dollars as you said not going to go a long way for for a small business necessarily but it goes enough of the way that they can at least keep the people that make that business work each and every day that it is open uh, be able to make a living when many other businesses similar to theirs are not able to do that for their employees well, you can find uh, that information and more if you just go to civiccentertv.com, click on the uh, coronavirus tab. And again, along with the headlines, we also put direct links to um, some resources for you to be able to look up information for yourself, including links to the CDC, the state of Michigan, Oakland County, and our local cities as well. So 
try to help you keep informed and up to date on all the changing information as we continue uh, with the COVID-19 crisis here in our local community. We're going to take a quick break here on this show, but we do have a great lineup for you here on the Thursday edition on the Megacast. And when we come back, we'll be speaking with the CEO for the M1 Concourse. This is the Oakland County Megacast. The only way to beat COVID-19 is to face it. You can't get too comfortable. You can't forget the danger. Wear the mask. Wear the mask. Wear the mask. Wash your hands. Keep a safe distance, especially in the next few months. You know we'll get back to normal. We'll get back to normal. We'll get back to normal. Someday. But not yet. Not yet. Not yet. But not yet. But not yet. Consider virtual gatherings for the holidays. Curbside food order. Grocery delivery. And shopping local. Shop local. And especially shopping local. Let's beat this virus. We can if we face it together. 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 For the latest information, visit oakgov.com forward slash COVID. Perry tested positive for COVID-19. Emma was exposed to a friend who's positive. Willa's waiting on test results. After any contact with COVID-19, or if you test positive, stay home for at least 10 days. If you live with others, keep your distance and wear a mask. Help Michigan contain COVID-19. Visit michigan.gov slash contain COVID. I think, I think we're gonna need to set this. We're excited to have you with us here on this Thursday. Thank you for taking time to be with us. I'm Ronnie Dahl, while Mr. Tyler holds things down uh, back there at the studio. Some good news uh, for the city of Pontiac and for the M1 concourse, because again, the Dream Cruise is going to look a lot different in 2021, but the good news is Pontiac is getting some love out of the Dream Cruise, and that is a lot because of the M1 concourse. With that, let's bring in the CEO, Jordan Zlothoff. It's great to have you with us. Thank you for having me, Ronnie. It's, uh, it's, glad, it's good to be here. Appreciate it. So we, I, when I heard the news come out about uh, the changes um, to what was happening, or I said Dream Cruise, but it's really the auto show, right? Correct, yeah. See, I'm not a car person. I get these events all confused, especially <laughs> after the auto show moved from January. It was going to move to the summer, and then summer didn't happen. And now it looks like it's not actually going to happen next year either. But they came up with a new event. Tell us about it. Absolutely. So uh, the auto show has been dealing with uh, a little bit of adversity lately, um, obviously having to cancel last year with the, the new summer date. Uh, that a lot of us were looking forward to. So that was a big move. Um, so uh, there was a decision made, and it was announced just a few weeks ago, um, that the uh, the North American International Auto Show wouldn't be happening in its current format that's usually held at uh, Cobo Hall, now TCF Center, uh, downtown Detroit, like we're all used to. Uh, really, a decision was made uh, in large part out of COVID concerns and whether or not we'd be able to have big indoor events come the fall. Um, and we just couldn't risk having another year without um, a big automotive activation in Detroit. So at M1 Concourse, we're an 87-acre outdoor motorsports and entertainment venue. We have a mile-and-a-half performance track. We're also home to the world's largest private garage community. So it's a place where people store cars, but they actually build these garages into entertainment suites. And it's like having a private luxury box in a sports stadium, except instead of overlooking basketball or football, uh, you're overlooking Porsches or Corvettes or Ferraris flying around our, our mile and a half track. So uh, the Detroit Auto Dealers Association, which puts on the auto show, is going to be able to use our, our venue in a way that uh, the traditional auto show hasn't uh, utilized before, which is on-track uh, activations, demonstrations, performance driving. Uh, we're looking at off-road courses, uh, you know, at a big scale. Um, uh, as opposed to just the smaller ones because of the limitations of the indoor facility. So this will all be happening at M1 Concourse uh, in September of this year. And it's really going to be a unique opportunity for all the auto automotive brands, both domestic based here in Detroit and the foreign ones to, to showcase their products and in a way that we haven't seen before. So 
Uh, really exciting news for, for Pontiac, obviously us here at M1 Concourse. And, uh, you know, I, I think this is a big opportunity for, uh, for the show uh, to present something new and fresh um, to, to customers that are, are looking for something more experiential than just uh, looking at a static car in a showroom. I really love this. And I think it's a perfect fit uh, because I've had to cover the auto show years and years and years and years. And you, oh, look at this car, you know? And for me, I'm like, hey, does it have heated seats? Does it have a heated steering wheel? I'm good. Um, but with that too, I know that they really wanted to try to start getting some of these events and outdoors. That was one of the reasons behind moving the auto show into the warmer months because January is not always so nice to hang out outdoors in downtown Detroit. <laughs> and, and so, of course, last year it's going to be the first big year for that. And then it didn't happen because of COVID. So for this to happen, it's like it is a perfect fit. And I wonder if um, post pandemic, this could be something that uh, sticks around as well. Yeah, so we were in partnership uh, discussions with the, uh, the Detroit Auto Dealers Association about doing something at M1 Concourse for a while. Um, we didn't know we'd be uh, moving the whole uh, uh, event activation here um, in the sort of stars just aligned and given concerns around, around COVID, we were happy to, uh, to host it um, and roll out the red carpet for them. Uh, but we certainly think there's a lot of opportunity um, in future years. Uh, I know there's a lot of folks that, that want to see a more traditional sh show move back to Detroit. I don't think we're in competition with Detroit. I think uh, we offer a unique venue uh, to showcase vehicle capabilities and experiential um, type automotive activations that can't be held in a traditional convention center. So uh, I think the future is bright um, in terms of using all the different assets, all the different venues, conference centers, uh, tracks, outdoor spaces, off-road courses. Um, for Detroit to have something really special over other cities like the New York Auto Show or the LA Auto Show um, or the ones that happen in Europe. Uh, and you might be familiar, we already do some of these uh, more off the, off the wall uh, type automotive events. Uh, each year we've hosted an event called Roadkill Nights where we actually shut down Woodward Avenue and we do legal eighth of a mile drag racing right on the street. Um, we're doing that at the same time. We're doing drift rides. Uh, in our arena event pad area. We're doing performance uh, hot laps um, in vehicles on the north loop of our track. Uh, we also have the big car show and static displays as well. So I think we're just scratching the surface for what cool things can really be done in terms of automotive events. Um, and we have actually four big events already planned for, for the fall. Um, uh, we haven't made an official announcement, but we're hopeful to, to do roadkill nights again this year. Um, obviously we'll be hosting Motorbella during the Woodward Dream Cruise, we'll be hosting an event here called the Woodward Dream Show. Uh, so an event that uh, really focuses a lot of the, the great things about the Dream Cruise here at M1. So uh, putting on a really cool car show that features some of the best uh, and most spectacular cars um, of that day. And then uh, a little later in the fall, a week after Motorbella, we're holding something called the American Speed Festival, uh, which is going to be a showcase of performance vehicles, both vintage and current performance cars. Uh, and we're going to be doing time trials on the track. And uh, I just can't think of a more exciting lineup from, from August to October of a really unique event that, that we'll be hosting here. Since you just mentioned uh, uh, time trials, I think that's the perfect time for me to bring bubbles over. That's my smart car. <laughs> well, uh, as we were talking about before we got on the air, uh, we don't have a, a track record with uh, with a smart car. So I think we're going to have to test out its uh, its performance capabilities uh, on the track. Uh, we have an autocross course that we set up, and I, I'd be willing to bet it's an extremely well handling car on the autocross course where it's not about uh, pure horsepower and, and performance. It's a lot about hand speed and handling. Uh, so uh, I think we could have a lot of fun with it. Exactly. Hey, Jordan, do you name your cars? Uh, or do you have too many? <laughs> I, I, no, I, you know, I don't have a huge collection, uh, but here at M1 Concourse, we're, we're a family business. Uh, my father is a, a big collector, uh, so he has a number um, of historic vehicles that he keeps here uh, on site at our venue in his garage. Uh, so I don't have a name for my car, but I know a lot of our other garage owners uh, do. And then vanity plates are the other one, uh, which, uh, you know, everyone has a I mean, not everyone, but a lot of a lot of folks have fun vanity plates that they like to put on their cars because, you know, it's about having fun. You know, some pe for some people, cars are about going from A to B and getting me there cost effectively and just comfortably. But for other people, 
it's an expression of them themselves. It's a, a place where they go for enjoyment, amusement. It's a, it's a, a collectible. It brings back a part of history. It's a, it's an art form. It's an engineering marvel. Um, and that's what we celebrate here. And that's what unites all of our garage owners, our club members, and then certainly our, our visitors uh, who come to M1 for our, for our public events. So it's a, it's a really special place that, that celebrates what Detroit is about and the automotive culture that's a part of our, our fabric here. Yeah, it really is a part of our fabric. And plus, not only that, but our economy as well, because there are so many different facets to the automotive industry. And that has that trickle down impact into every community and every neighborhood here in the greater Detroit area. Uh, absolutely. I mean, I, I don't think there's another place in the world that has the concentration of not only the, the OEMs and manufacturers, but the tier one suppliers uh, and all the other uh, components that go into the supply chain for the, the automotive uh, process, not to mention restoration, aftermarket, uh, and the ancillary components to the car business. It's, it's a huge part of the economy and uh, you know, we, we're excited to be a part of it and, and capture uh, all the automotive business and, and interest that's, that's here in Detroit. When you guys were coming up with um, the M1 concourse and you were, you know, trying to get your plans together as to where to build the facility, did you give any thought to doing it somewhere outside of the Metro Detroit area? Yeah. So, you know, going back five, six, seven years ago, uh, when we were scouting locations for the venue, uh, there were many places that we were looking, uh, looking for and, and looking at um, around the area. I can tell you it was, it was a big stroke of luck that we found our current site. So uh, we're in the city of Pontiac, uh, right at the corner of Woodward Avenue uh, in South Boulevard. Uh, obviously being on Woodward Avenue and all the history behind uh, uh, the oldest paved road in America uh, is huge. But even more than that, uh, being so close to uh, everyone within the metropolitan area. If you go around the country, you look at other uh, performance tracks or racetrack facilities, they're built anywhere from one to two to three hours outside the actual facility. Uh, they're difficult to get to. Um, there's often very little around them in terms of restaurants, hotels, amenities. So we're built on the site of a former General Motors manufacturing facility. It was actually torn down in the early 2000s. Uh, and we won the right to develop this property uh, from the federal government. Uh, it was put into an entity called the Racer Trust um, for repurposing uh, former automotive facilities. Uh, so the fact that we were able to find this 87 acre parcel that, that needed development, um, and also that we were in the city of Pontiac, which was looking for creative de development, um, interesting ideas to, uh, to boost the economy and attract people to the city. Uh, we were very fortunate, um, and that's difficult to find and why, uh, facilities like M1 concourse are difficult to replicate across the country and, and maybe haven't as, haven't enjoyed as much success because, uh, one, they're not in Detroit and Detroit just has uh, the largest concentration of enthusiasts. I mean, you, you can't pick a better city to build a venue like ours in. Um, but also we are just so close to the, uh, the neighborhoods um, in Oakland County uh, where, there, where there is this concentration. We're uh, 15 minutes from, from Birmingham, 20 minutes from Royal Oak. Uh, you can get to Detroit in 30 minutes. So really we're, we're 30 to 40 minutes from anywhere you could possibly, possibly be in Metro Detroit. Uh, it just makes it so convenient and you can come out here uh, for a small event, spend an hour or two here and then go back home as opposed to having to take your entire day off to go visit a track that might be, you know, several hours in a rural community outside the city. So uh, we looked at a lot of different uh, places and plots where we could build this and, and we were very fortunate to find this one here in Pontiac. But I think uh, you moving there too is really going to reshape that area, which needed it desperately because it was a vacant lot for the longest time. Uh, Pontiac is going through a huge revitalization. Uh, we are one small part of it and we're, we're proud to, um, but uh, give a lot of credit to uh, United Shore, United Wholesale Mortgage, which is building uh, or expanding their campus just down the street, Williams International uh, uh, just down the street as well. Uh, the downtown, um, the redevelopment of the Strand Theater in downtown Pontiac. So very exciting things happening for the city. And more and more businesses are seeing Pontiac as an attractive place to, to relocate, uh, to bring their employees um, and, and to grow their business. Yeah, I was sad though, uh, to see that restaurant right around the corner 
close. Um, I forget the name of it, but it had the racing theme to it. They had great burgers. Um, but I was by there the other day and I saw that they have closed down. So hopefully, though, well, um, that's such a good location. Someone's going to have to pick it back up. Yeah, well, well we're actually opening our, our own restaurant on property in the fall. So uh, come September, we will have completed uh, a 30,000 square foot event center and restaurant. So this will allow us to hold uh, indoor corporate private events, um, as well as there'll be a public restaurant with a second level rooftop patio that overlooks the track. Uh, so we can invite the public in uh, for meals and drinks, essentially seven days a week. So it's a brand new chapter for us. So we think we're gonna have the, the best location uh, in town for, uh, for burgers and drinks and, and all other fare uh, sitting right next to the track in, in pit lane. So we're excited to, to see that open and it's all currently uh, under development. We send out a, a weekly uh, construction, uh, or sorry, a, a monthly construction video update uh, via our social media platforms on, on Facebook and Instagram. Uh, so you can actually see the progress right now. Uh, and we're also completing another 60,000 square feet of new garages, uh, another 82 individual units. Um, three new buildings uh, and uh, you know, and like I said, we're the world's largest private garage community last year and, and we're just expanding that um, each year. So lo lots of fun developments happening here uh, at M1. I, I think it's great that you're going to have a restaurant there that's going to be open to the public because you can see like a new generation of car enthusiasts being born out of that because it's going to be a place where, you know, parents can take their kids and they can sit there and enjoy this together and continue that culture because you wonder too, a lot of the young kids now, a lot of them don't even want to get their driver's license. I don't understand that. It's like, <laughs> hey, I had a moped. I was like, as soon as I could get my freedom with that driver's license, I was off. But some of the, you know, the newer generation, they don't necessarily want to drive. They'll take an Uber or Lyft. Uh, so I think if they can get that culture and continue, uh, because it is more than just getting behind the wheel and getting from point A to point B. The, the fascinating thing about the automotive enthusiast, uh, let's just say population or folks that are interested in cars, is there are so many unique niches. Some folks are interested in hot rods and rat rods. Some are interested in modern exotic uh, performance track cars. Uh, but I can tell you, we have groups that are all about mopeds, all about motorcycles. We actually have a, a group that likes to tune uh, Saturn ions, the, the old uh, Saturn coupes, um, um, and trick them out and make them performance vehicles. Uh, there's actually a, a club uh, that owns the uh, General Motors Winnebago's that used to be built on our property, and they will bring them out. So all these groups are on display uh, for our cars and coffee events. We, we hold them five times a year at M1 Concourse on Saturdays. They're free to the public. Uh, we serve coffee and donuts. Uh, and it's just a great way to, to have an open air car show and see the full diversity of, of these automotive interests that, that everyone has. Uh, so it's really cool. And the fact that we're going to have a restaurant, the public can come in every day, uh, is just going to be a very unique and dynamic element uh, for us to have here. Jordan, have you had any previous employees from GM that used to work at that site um, come and visit and, and see what you guys have done with the area? all the time. It's, it's unbelievable how many folks come through and say, you know, I used to work at the validation center here. I used to work at the assembly plant when it was here. Um, so uh, we're very connected to the community. And a lot of people remember when the plant used to be here uh, and what a difference it made uh, for Pontiac. And they're excited to see this, this new development that's uh, come on its heels um, and really transform the area. Do any of the automotive companies bring some of their test vehicles out there? And do you get like sneak peeks at all? Uh, um, all the time. Uh, I would say that we primarily do more unveilings, uh, marketing events, launches. Uh, a lot of the testing is held in proving grounds uh, that the facilities own and have. Uh, we will occasionally do testing a lot of times for uh, smaller manufacturers um, who may not have a dedicated facility, uh, but we're doing photo shoots all the time. Uh, uh, particularly with Ford, with the launch of the new Mustang. Uh, we did a lot of the photo shoots here. Uh, this was just over the summer. Uh, but cars from all the manufacturers, GM, FCA, foreign brands, uh, it's a great place to, to shoot videos. And when it's time to launch, to bring in media, uh, to bring in outside clients, especially because uh, these brands may not want the media seeing the other test cars or the other prototypes um, or the other you know, skunk, work, skunk Works projects they have uh, going on. 
they can just roll out the cars that they're going to unveil, uh, showcase it um, to their clients, to the media and the world. Um, and we're a perfect place to do that. I, you know, I saw one of the Mustangs um, on the freeway the other day, and I have to say, I'm confused. I'm confused with that marketing because um, it looks like an SUV to me. And also it's an electric car. Uh, like part of the Mustang is the sound, you know, the revving of the engine. What were your thoughts when you saw it? Did you get to drive it? So uh, I haven't driven it yet. And uh, I know you're referring to the, the Mach-E, the new electric SUV. I love anything that pushes boundaries. Uh, I know uh, uh, that model in particular uh, was very controversial amongst uh, the very loyal uh, Mustang following um, that Ford has. But there's no question we're, we're moving in the direction of electrification. Uh, we're moving towards more and more SUVs um, or, or CUVs, um, compact utility vehicles. Uh, but I like companies that take risks, are bold, push the boundaries, um, and try to you know meet unique customer needs. So I applaud any company that's going to put something out in the market that is transformative and gets people talking because that's that's what it's all about in my mind. People are definitely talking about it, and I do like what the vehicle looks like. It's just that Mustang brand. Uh, that they shifted. And I will say after uh, having my smart car, it is a second car because mine only gets like, you know, 70 miles um, to the charge. So it's perfect around Kegel and I can, you know, I can make it to Pontiac uh, and back and, and those areas, but I do have an SUV um, for it to be able to actually get to Detroit. And yeah, back and forth. Ronnie, you didn't, you didn't, you didn't, you didn't tell me your smart car was the electric version of the smart car. That's uh <laughs> that's like a unicorn in the, uh, the Detroit area. So, uh, I don't know if I've actually seen that car uh, in person. So now we're definitely going to have to get it out here on the track because um, uh, that's, a, that's again, just a really unique, you know, fun car. Um, and there's very few of them out there. So you're, you're welcome anytime. Definitely. You know, it's the funniest thing is that when my husband drives it, people are the, like, it's a clown car. But then once they actually get in and uh, drive it, they're all like, it's much bigger than you think it is. And it's very zippy. Yeah, I mean, that's that's the beauty of the electric powertrains. Uh, you know, there's no question all the manufacturers are, are moving in that direction, releasing new models. Um, GM in particular has, has a huge mission um, to accomplish that, but uh, all the manufacturers are releasing incredible new cars. Um, and they're, like you said, they're a ton of fun to drive. Um, and they offer performance capabilities that uh, the gas engines don't. So uh, I think as consumers get in them um, and try them, you're going to win a lot of people over. Just like you're saying, you know, get your husband in the car and uh, it puts a smile on their face before they know it. Yeah, he thought I was crazy when I brought it home. I didn't tell him. I just showed up. I was like, hey, I bought this car. He was like, what? Why? <laughs> uh, with that, Jordan, um, I will say one thing, if, if they want electric cars to be, become more common, they definitely have to address the issue of having charging stations and enough places. Yeah. Because, you know, if you're driving to grandma's house in Ohio, you want to be able to to make sure you can get there and get back. So, I mean, there is an app for people with smart car or with electric cars to show you where you can charge uh, your vehicle and, and things of that nature. Jordan, it's always great having you uh, with us. We love having you in the Pontiac neighborhood and uh, right here in our backyards. Um, again, your social media for people, uh, where can they keep up with everything that's happening out there? Because you guys have a lot going on. Yeah, absolutely. So follow us at uh, m1concourse.com is our website. Um, we're on Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Uh, so our handles are, are at m1concourse. Uh, so please join us. You can sign up for our mailing list on our website or, or follow us on any of the social media feeds. But uh, a lot of exciting things happening. Uh, we make posts frequently. So uh, uh, please check us out and hope uh, some of your listeners are going to join us for the events we have lined up this year. Great to have you with us. Anything I didn't maybe touch on that you want to add before we let you go? You know what? You, you hit it. Just uh, we're very excited. The Cars and Coffee events we have lined up this year. We'll have an annual Fourth of July uh, fireworks show. Um, we're going to have a big launch when our uh, our event center and restaurant uh, is ready to open, and we do the ribbon cutting. Uh, very excited uh, about potentially putting together roadkill nights again and the drag racing on Woodward and the Woodward Dream Show on Dream Cruise Weekend and the American Speed Festival. Uh, the week after the Motor Bella event. And of course, Motor Bella, uh, it's going to be a huge marquee event in the Detroit area uh, with the Detroit Auto Dealers Association um, hosting the big automotive activation uh, here at M1 Concourse. So uh, that's at motorbella.com. You can read all the details um, about uh, 
uh, the Detroit Auto Show, building a new event uh, here at M1 Concourse. You guys are very busy over there. <laughs> yeah, there, there's a lot going on and uh, a lot of blocking and tackling to do every day, but it's exciting. I mean, we have fun doing this um, and it, it's just a great place to be. Well, again, we're, we're so lucky to have you in our backyard and we wish uh, you and your team, because I know it's a lot of hard work as well, continued success, because uh, definitely a lot of people enjoy what you guys have out there, uh, again, at Woodward and South Boulevard. Jordan, thank you for your time. Hey, thank you for hosting me and you're welcome anytime at M1 Concourse. Thank you. I'll see you out there in Bubbles. Well, her real name is Carmen Electric, by the way, but Bubbles is her nickname. <laughs> I can't wait. We're going to take a quick break here on the Megacast. When we come back, we'll be uh, talking with the chief for the Michigan Department of Natural Resources. This is the Oakland County Megacast. COVID-19 has caused many families to fall behind on finances and on groceries. But you're not alone. You shouldn't have to worry about putting food on the table. MyBridges offers access to quality food and income assistance to help families across the state get the food support they need. It's easy to apply and easy to start shopping. Apply for services at michigan.gov slash MIBridges. A message from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. Michigan, we're calling on you to save lives. Don't ignore it. Don't let it go to voicemail. It's urgent. In fact, it's critical. Because if you've been in close contact with someone who tests positive for COVID-19, you may have been exposed to the virus. And you could get a call from My COVID Help or your local health department. So please answer the call to learn how to protect yourself, your family, and friends. We're calling on you to stop the spread of COVID-19, to make it safe to reopen businesses and help Michigan move forward. So if you get a call, from my COVID help or your local health department, you may have been exposed to someone with COVID-19. To protect us all, answer the call. Learn more at michigan.gov slash contain COVID. A message from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. to have you with us here on the Thursday edition of the Oakland County Mega Cast. Uh, we want to say thank you to the Greater West Bloomfield Chamber of Commerce for allowing us to live stream today's edition of the Mega Cast on their Facebook page. You can also uh, check out full episodes of previous shows of the Mega Cast on civiccentertv.com. And with that, uh, it is wintertime in Michigan. And for so many people, one of their favorite pastimes this time of year is to get out on the ice. To talk a little bit more about that, let's bring in Jim Dexter. He's uh, the fisheries chief for the Michigan Department of Natural Resources. Jim, great to have you with us. Good morning, Ronnie. Glad to be here with you today. I, I saw people ice skating uh, on Sylvan Lake this past weekend. I took my dog to Dodge Park. They were out there ice fishing. It looks like a lot of fun, but I will say I get a little nervous. How do people know when it's safe to go out on the ice? Well, that's a really good question because you do have to be careful. Um, typically, you need to have quite a bit of ice for it to be safe to support your weight, you know, at least four inches. The DNR does not necessarily support any particular uh, depth of ice. You have to check it. Um, there are a lot of people that go out there. I mean, this is something they do every year. They know when the ice gets good, they check it. The best thing is that you know, one, you don't go out by yourself. And two, you go where other people have been. Um, you need to have the right equipment to check that ice, whether it's an auger to get through the ice, to check that depth, to make sure it's gonna support your weight <clears throat> or a spud that you can get through the ice to see how thick it is. And this has been a really difficult year, Ronnie, because it's probably gonna be one of the warmest winters we've had. Um, warm temperatures, lack of snow. We, I think we just had an accident recently in your area where a snowmobiler went through the ice. You can get just a little skip of ice covered by snow and people think it's good, but it's not. So you have to be very careful. Yeah, and that it, it is tragic. And it seems like we have one of these cases every single year. In that case, it was a snow snowmobiler over on Wolverine Lake. Um, I know that we were talking with the West Bloomfield Fire Department and they had a situation where someone's dog went out on the ice. 
um, and the, you know, their pet fell through and then died as well. So these are so many things for people to watch for. Um, so, but is it better if you're closer to the water's edge or do you really need to know that water before you even step out there? Well, it's definitely good to know uh, the lake that you're going on and what the water's like. And depending on what the weather is like, sometimes the edge can be very difficult because if there's sunshine, if the ice is kind of thin, it'll melt on the edge, but it'll be good out later, you know, out further on the, on the lake. So you really do need to know where you're going. Some lakes have springs. Sometimes there's currents that are coming in from rivers. Ice can be thinner in one area and plenty thick in another. And again, this has just been a very, very difficult year. Um, I mean, here we are at the end of January, typically in Southern Michigan, and I'm from your area. I grew up in Troy and went to school in Bloomfield Hills. Um, typically, you know, we've been fishing for six weeks already. We're usually fishing in mid-December, definitely by Christmas. And really it's only been about the past week that you can get out on our local lakes in the Southern part of the state. If you go up to the Northern part, you know, up in the UP, we've got a foot. 15 inches of ice, um, but there are lakes that are still wide open. Uh, Higgins Lake is open. As an example, deeper, deeper inland lakes are open, but shallower, smaller lakes, you know, they're getting good ice. For, I have talked to a lot of people that um, like to go ice fishing. I think they're crazy, but for those that maybe want to try it for the first time, what is the attraction? It's cold out there. Oh, if you're dressed, if you're dressed right, it's going to be just fine. You know, you got to have some gloves. You got to have a good warm hat, you know, but you don't need a lot to go out, you know, and to, to participate in ice fishing, it's, it's like any other sport. Uh, you can really go all in and get some really nice equipment. You can have a, a sled that you pull out. That's a pop-up. It's like a pop-up camper, you know, blocks the wind. You have some light source, you have some heat source in there. You can take your coat off and you can fish and real comfort but that's a lot of work you can also go out there very simply with just a bucket and an auger and uh, a cheap rod in fact i've got i've got an example here of the rods that people use you know it's a little rod it's about three feet long small reel with a you know a, a, a hook on there that you're going to put a minnow or a wax worm something that you can use for bait Here's a different type of rod that people use. It's called a schoolie reel. You can buy rods like this for, you know, $10, $15 at a bait shop and you're good to go. And you get a nice 35 degree day out and the sunshine is the sun shining and the wind is low. You cut a hole, sit on your bucket. It's really nice to sit out there, especially if the fish are biting. If the fish are biting, you aren't going to notice the cold. I'm just thinking, and when you said a heat source, somehow or another, the words heat source while you're sitting on a lake and cutting a hole in the ice, those words don't seem like they go well together. Yeah, there, there's, I mean, from the simple hand warmers that you put in your pocket, you know, like if you're skiing or, you know, taking a walk, you can buy those little hand warmers. Those are always good to have. Um, and in these, if you're like in a shanty, people will bring little propane tanks and there's little buddy heaters that you can you know take the chill out of the air so uh, with that uh jim do you is it better or is it easier to fish in the winter time than summertime i mean are the fish biting more i guess is what i want to say you know it depends there are slow times there are fast times the, the good thing about winter is this is you know if especially in your area you know i think about kegel harbor sylvan lake cast like you know not everybody has a boat not everybody can get out on those waters but you can experience in them once they freeze up, you know, getting on at a public access, you're free to roam. You are free to roam that lake and find a spot to fish. Um, and there are a lot of good places in your area to do that. You just gotta be careful, you know, and make sure, you know, if you're new to it, you wanna find somebody that's done it before that can take you out. Cause if you're new, you're gonna wanna catch fish. If you don't catch fish in three or four hours, you're not gonna wanna do this again. But if somebody can put you on fish, you're not going to notice it's cold. You're going to have a great time and you're potentially going to have a meal to take home. I was watching an episode, I think it was on Real Sports, where they were talking about um, some huge event. I forget where it was. Some of these people really invest a lot of money in technology and equipment and trying to find the fish. And to me, I was like, well, isn't that kind of like cheating? 
Yeah, you can you can look at it that way. I mean, technology has really advanced over the last couple of decades. So in addition to, you know, people pulling these portable shanties with a snowmobile or with their four wheeler, they've got various types of sonar electronics. You can even put cameras down and that's become very, very popular. People will cut their hole and you lower a camera down to where you're fishing and you can watch the fish coming into your bait and know that, you know, oh, that's a walleye, that's a perch, that's a bluegill, great, let's see if we can catch them. So yeah, there's lots of, uh, you can invest quite a bit into this sport. Wow, it really is fascinating for people that have never done it once to see how involved people will take it as well. And I guess that's with any sport. Um, Jim Dexter with us here. He's with the Michigan Department of Natural Resources. I saw a recent headline, Jim, talking about the water levels on the Great Lakes. Can you talk a little bit about the possibility of the climate change and what this could mean overall for the state of Michigan and our waters? Sure. It's um, it's really quite something to see. Um, I mean, last year we experienced some of the highest water levels in the Great Lakes that we have seen since 1986, 1987. In fact, I believe that they surpassed that. Um, they have come down about 12 inches since July, but we're and we're getting near the end of the cycle where the lakes will be coming down from evaporation and they will start going back up as soon as things start melting. Um, and it's an issue. It's a huge issue for shoreline property owners. I know they're in the, you know, St. Clair shore areas, downriver, um, you know, the water levels are right at land levels. And there has been property damage and there may very well likely continue to be property damage. The difficult thing in terms of climate change, you know, uh, changes in weather patterns is we don't know what's going to happen in the very near future. Models are very uh, clear in that temperatures are going to continue to warm, uh, and that may mean that we have more wet seasons um, as we have had the past couple of years. Uh, I believe 2019 was one of the wettest years on record for Lake Michigan, or for the state of Michigan, and that raises the water level in all of the Great Lakes. So it's an issue, um, and right now the Army Corps of Engineers follows the water levels. They give monthly updates as to their predictions. And it's a 50-50 uh, crapshoot right now, whether we're gonna be back up to record levels this year or whether it will go down. Based on the past couple of months, we've, we are seeing very little precipitation. And that's throughout the Great Lakes Basin. Even in the Upper Peninsula, there's not very much snow and it's very, very unusual. Yeah, so what happens now impacts uh, our water levels into the summer months as well then. Yes, it definitely does. You know, So you've had people on many inland lakes, they've had to raise their docks or they've had to put in floating docks to uh, account for those water level changes. We have lakes here in Southwest Michigan. I live in Kalamazoo right now. Uh, and I know there are lakes in Southeast Michigan where the water levels are high. People have had to sandbag their properties. And that's something that they've never had to do before. So it's not just the Great Lakes that are high, it's our water tables are high. We have water everywhere. And that's one of the great things about Michigan is we are a water rich state. Um, and we should be thankful for that. But right now, I mean, this is a difficult time for everybody because of the conditions that uh, high water levels have on lakefront property owners. Uh, and, you know, so many times that property is high value property and very well sought after it. But then you uh, know people that maybe have had to deal with some of these things and they'll move inland because they're like, it's not worth the hassle, right? Um, yeah, Jim, that is so, true. So you said you grew up here in our area, Troy, Bloomfield Hills. Uh, how'd you get into your line of work? Uh, family. I was my, with my grandfather. We had a place up in Northern Michigan and I spent a lot of time on a small inland lake in Lewiston and learned to fish and hunt. And I've been a fish nut ever since I can remember. I mean, it goes back to, you know, three, four, five years old, went to school at Michigan State University, got a degree in fisheries and wildlife, and I've been working in fisheries now since 1983. Um, love the state of Michigan. We have world-class fisheries resources. I mean, there are not very many places in this country, and, and I'll talk about not wintertime, but in the summertime, where you could, you could go out and take a charter boat in the morning and catch Chinook salmon, coho salmon, steelhead, 
as an example, lake trout. You could come in in the afternoon, you could go bluegill fishing, bass fishing, perch fishing. In the evening, you could go trout fishing on a river, catch brook trout, brown trout. Uh, you know, the diversity that we have is truly amazing. And that's throughout all corners of the state. And I'm, I'm so proud to be able to lead my staff to manage those fisheries and improve them for, for our citizens of the state and for people that come and visit. So with so many kids um, going to school remotely and individuals, um, their parents may be working remotely as well. Have you seen an increase in the number of people uh, taking advantage of our water and um, some of our natural resources this past year? Yeah, and that's that's true more than just fisheries. It's true throughout everything that we do in the Department of Natural Resources, whether it's people hiking on trails, whether it's people camping, hunting and fishing, huge increases in participation. In fishing in particular, we saw an increase, a 10% increase in license sales this past year. Anyone that's 17 or over needs a license. If you're 16 or younger, you do not need a fishing license. Um, so we saw a 10% increase and a 40% increase in young people doing it for the first time or at least the first time in the past five years. So huge jump in our metrics because we've been pretty stable over the last several years. We're losing a little bit of our angling population, uh, but it was very good to see uh, the increased participation across the board, whether you're out walk, going for a walk or hunting or getting out on the water because you never know some of those kids that maybe did it for the first time they could be the future jim dexter there you go <laughs> i like that i like that a lot uh jim quickly before we let you go uh, anything maybe we didn't ask that you want to share uh, with our audience well at least in terms of the ice fishing i really do want to um hit on that message of please be safe you know make sure you go out with somebody make sure you check the ice um, we've got a lot of great opportunities throughout the entire state of Michigan. Uh, these are great species to fish for. You're primarily fishing for bluegill, for perch, for walleye, for northern pike. They're, they make great table fare. And it's, a, it's really a great family activity. Uh, to take kids out for their first time is really a lot of fun. And, you know, they can, if, if the fish aren't biting, they can ice skate, they can run around and chase each other, throw snowballs. Bring snacks if you're taking kids for the first time, because after the first hour, they're going to want to eat something. And hopefully you're going to catch some fish and have a great time and have a new angler. That's awesome. Jim, thank you so much for being with us. We so appreciate your time. Thank you, Ronnie. Glad to be with you. Happy fishing. Thank you. We're going to take a quick break here on the Megacast. Hi, my name is Kurt Lawson, and I'm the Public Information Officer for West Bloomfield Township. We wanted to reach out to you, our older adults, to provide information that you may find useful during this difficult time. We want to ensure you that West Bloomfield Town Hall, our Waters and Utility Department, West Bloomfield Parks, and our Police and Fire Departments continue to work hard on your behalf. Information and resources can be found on the Township website, the Police Facebook and Twitter, or call West Bloomfield Parks COVID-19 Help Hotline. Please remember to keep your social distance of at least six feet, wear facial coverings when you leave your home, and wash your hands for at least 20 seconds with soap. These precautions will help keep you safe during these difficult times. This may seem uncomfortable, but so is being hooked to an IV, sleeping in a hospital bed, and fighting for your life. When it comes to COVID-19, Comfort is not as important as saving lives. Wearing a mask can greatly reduce the chance of spreading the virus. So mask up, Michigan, every time you leave home. Second hour of the Thursday edition of the Oakland County Mega Cast. I'm Ronnie Dahl in my home studios while Mr. Tyler Keith holds things down for us back there at the main studio in West Bloomfield. As a reminder, you can always catch us Monday through Friday, 10 a.m. until noon, Civic Center TV, Birmingham Area Municipal Access, 
If you have cable, we want to say thank you. You can find us on channel 15. If you have Comcast 99 on AT&T, you can also listen to us on the radio, 89.3 Lakes FM, 88.1 FM, the BIP. And then we also want to say thank you today to the Greater West Bloomfield Chamber of Commerce for allowing us to live stream today's edition of the Megacast on their Facebook page. But with that, let's go ahead and we are going to stop in to the city of Orchard Lake, one of the prettiest little cities here in our region. And with that, Jerry McCollum is with us. He's the Director of City Services. Jerry, Happy New Year. And Happy New Year to you too, Ronnie. Good to see you again. It was so different uh, this New Year's than last year. Did you make any uh, New Year's resolutions for the city of Orchard Lake? Um, not really. Uh, hopefully we can get back to some normalcy this year compared to last year. Um, but uh, yeah, it's uh, a new start. Let's call it that. <laughs> and, and we're hoping uh, it's going to be a bit more hopeful this year, right? With the oh, vaccine. Absolutely. absolutely. Uh, but Jerry, in the middle of all of this, we're 10 plus months into it. How do you even try to manage a budget during this time? Or can you? Well, it, it is difficult because obviously we have some additional expenses that we incurred due to the pandemic. Um, uh, we've been uh, very fortunate though to receive several grants through Oakland County through the CARES Act. Uh, so as far as the budget goes, we haven't had too much of an influx uh, uh, or a, a change in the original budget that was adopted. Uh, we do do quarterly budget amendments. So uh, we look at that every quarter of the year to uh, adjust it accordingly. But overall, we're in pretty good financial shape. And, and that's a good place to be um, mm -hmm. because there are a lot of other cities that aren't sitting in that same position. Absolutely. And the, the big benefit this, that we're going to see this upcoming fiscal year, Ronnie, is the fact that of our pension obligations are really going to start dropping off and some of our uh, other post-employment benefits, or we call them OPEB benefits, will be starting to decline also. So good for the city, good for our taxpayers. One of the things that we are starting to hear now is um, support for our local and state governments coming out of D.C. under President Biden. Any discussion about that there in uh, the city of Orchard Lake, or is this just really one of those things where you wait and see, and if it becomes available, you're grateful? Yeah, I think uh, I think that's a good point there is we're going to probably wait and see what happens here. You know, we've been very uh, fiscally sound through the this last fiscal year, again, with some of the the CARES Act funds that we received that uh, filled the holes where we had some of the uh, extra expenses due to the COVID situation. But uh, um, yeah, we're, uh, we'll are we just kind of see what happens. And if we need to need to take advantage of that, then we will. The biggest thing that we were, uh, that we were informed of is that our revenue sharing, our state revenue sharing uh, will be made whole because we were really concerned about that with all the COVID and with the sales tax being down overall that we were going to see a big drop in our state uh, revenue sharing that we received through the state of Michigan. Bye. So how much money is that uh, for you in your budget? Typically on an average year about 225 dollars to $250,000. Most of our revenue comes from our, our tax base, which we have a very good tax base, obviously being uh, uh, around the water and the property values tend to hold quite well around the lakes and stuff. So but uh, every little bit helps the community. Uh, you know, if, if it's state revenue sharing, our tax base, but um, uh, you know, our, we've been very fiscally responsible through the years. I give credit to our city council, our previous uh, administration uh, that have done uh, a great job on the city expenses throughout the last 30, 40 years. One of the surprising things right now, housing values. They are up and that is really, um, you know, a good base for so many communities such as yours. Yes. Yeah, and actually, you know, you make a good point there, Ronnie, is, is you know, as I indicated before, most of our income comes from our tax base. Um, overall, we've seen a, uh, not necessarily an increase, but a steady uh, flow of new construction. Uh, granted, we are a built up community, but we have a lot of teardowns. Well, we do have a very limited amount of vacant property, but we're seeing we're we're getting a lot, our building department's been pretty active. So uh, with that, obviously that's new tax base uh, at a higher level. So uh, we're, we're very fortunate for a small community. <clears throat> yeah, I know some of the houses in my neighborhood, I mean, they'll sell within a day or two of going on the market. It's been amazing to see how strong the housing market is, but yet we're in the middle of a pandemic. Uh, Jerry, you just mentioned your building department. Uh, tell us about how city services are working there in Orchard Lake. Can people actually come into the, into the building or is pretty much everything online? 
Well, well, Ronnie, we always try to tell the our customers, whether it be residents or contractors, what try to do as much as we can online. City Hall is open back up. We are open up uh, with business. We have full staff back, but obviously we have our precautions in place. We're following all the Oakland County guidelines, the State of Michigan Health Department guidelines. Um, so with that being said, you will find that a lot of individuals want to do the uh, electronic, like uh, per, uh, submitting for permits, um, uh, 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 submitting information and plans and stuff like that. They'll do that electronically. So um, albeit they can come in, they're more than welcome to come to City Hall. Obviously you have to have mask on and, and all the other criteria, but uh, uh, we're trying to get back to somewhat business as usual, if you want to call it that. How does it work though? Like if you, um, someone needs to do an inspection because there are some things I would imagine probably kind of hard to do virtually. Yes, actually. And that, I mean, we've struggled with that throughout all, all, all of Oakland County. We've had many meetings with other code officials uh, throughout Oakland County and trying to, uh, especially when the pandemic was hitting hard, hard and heavy back in March of last year in November. But uh, the, uh, we do have protocols in place through the building department for inspections. Uh, for a while there, we did suspend all occupied home inspections. For example, we had to go into a water heater inspection or something like that. Uh, we suspended those. We are back doing those, but obviously with precautions in place. Uh, new construction is a little bit different because you are dealing with a structure that's not occupied. Uh, typically, it's more open, uh, more free airflow, et cetera, feel a little bit safer in those. So, But all in all, we've been uh, still providing our inspections and, and doing the job that we have to do. So. So with that, uh, Orchard Lake is such a busy area there. Um, I always, the one thing I don't like about your city is because the Orchard Lake, it, it, there's no way around it. And if it goes under construction, you're sitting there. Um, any road plans coming up? I mean, I know we're in the middle of winter, but it, it's uh, never too early to start planning, right? That is that is correct. But the 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 main, main roads in our city are actually under the jurisdiction of the Road Commission of Oakland County. That includes Orchard Lake Road, Pontiac Trail, and Commerce Road. Uh, a couple of years ago, we participated in an overlay program with Oakland County through some tri-party money to pave Commerce Road. So that was entirely repaved or capped. So there won't be any work on there. I do know that they are looking at doing some work, I think in 22 uh, on Orchard Lake Road. Uh, and that will extend all the way from Commerce all the way up to Middle Belt. So as you know, Commerce or uh, Orchard Lake Road is a very, very busy road, very congested. So. But uh, that is again, all handled through the Road Commission of Oakland County. <clears throat> so uh, how does it work with your uh, city roads that you have there? Uh, do you guys contract out because you are such a small community with um, maybe the Road Commission, the Oakland County Road Commission or nearby cities to uh, handle any you know snow removal and things of that nature? No, actually we have uh, two gentlemen of our DPW that handle the winter rate maintenance on our local roads. And that's all our subdivisions, Old Orchard Trail, Indian Trail, et cetera. But uh, uh, those guys have had a few events this year. Uh, I actually uh, wear another hat too, is I'll put, I'll put my DPW hat on. Sometimes I have to jump in the truck, but I do what I have to do to, to, to make sure the residents are safe. But our, um, our local roads are in pretty good shape. We have a capital outlay plan for paving that we do uh, every year. And then that, that comes up our general fund money. So we don't have to do any special assessment districts to our residents. Uh, that's part of their taxes they pay is our roads and all the other services that are provided by the city. But all in all, we've been really doing aggressive uh, uh, repaving of our uh, local roads. And we're getting to the point now where we're, we're almost to the top where um, all the roads have been completed already with a cap. Not in the same, they might not need it again, but all in all, it's uh, we're in pretty good shape. Jerry uh, McCollum with us here on the Megacast. He's the director of city services over there at the city of Orchard Lake Village. And with that, Jerry, uh, anything maybe I didn't ask you that you want to share before we uh, let you go? Uh, just a couple of things with uh, budget real quick. You know, this is a busy time of year for budgets. We are preparing for our fiscal year that starts July 1 through June 30th. So we're gearing up on that. But uh, no, I, I appreciate you having me on, Ronnie. It's always good to talk to you and, and, and promote our little city. As you said, we got a we got a we got a beautiful city here. We got a gem, and we're very fortunate. So, you do. It's one of the most beautiful stretches along the trail. Mm -hmm. uh, I like to take it down to the Starbucks and that and then back, and it is absolutely beautiful uh, yep. down there. And you can see the lake on the one side as well. Uh, with that, Jerry, quickly, are you guys still doing like um, your hearings and your meetings? Everything is still virtual at this time. It is the only uh, meeting that we do not. 
that we don't do virtually is our planning commission. It's usually it's just it's a six member board. We usually don't have the public attend. The uh, city council meetings slash the zoning board meetings are all virtual because again, you don't know how many people will attend and we're still trying to meet the requirements of the uh, health department, the state of Michigan, and obviously Olin County guidelines as well. So I know we're gonna do that at least through March, Ronnie. I don't know what's gonna happen after that, um, but uh, for now, yes. What's been the feedback from the community? Do they like those because it's a little bit easier for them to attend? Absolutely. Uh, you know, we have a few snowbirds that go south. So obviously with virtual meetings, you can attend anywhere you're located at. So it is a benefit to them. Um, but I find that as a couple of our council members even actually like it. But I'm the kind of person I like to be face to face. I like to see the people, talk to them face to face. A uh, little different for me, but uh, eventually we'll get back to where we have our regular meetings in person. We will. Yeah, I think some of those Zoom calls and you get so many people in it, I get confused. I'm like, wait, who, what, <laughs> when, where? Yes, yes. It can be quite complicated sometimes. <laughs> well, Jerry, it's always great having you with us here on the show. Well, thank you, Ronnie. I appreciate it. Good seeing you again. You too. And we're wishing you and your team the best in 2021. Thank you so much. We're going to take a quick break here on the Megacast. When we come back, we will be turning our attention to the a big fight with some of the high school athletes and the rally coming up this weekend and the push to let the kids play. This is the Oakland County Megacast. The only way to beat COVID-19 is to face it. You can't get too comfortable. You can't forget the danger. Wear the mask. Wear the mask. Wear the mask. Wash your hands. Keep a safe distance, especially in the next few months. You know we'll get back to normal. We'll get back to normal. We'll get back to normal. Someday. But not yet. Not yet. Not yet. But not yet. But not yet. Consider virtual gatherings for the holidays. Curbside food order. Grocery delivery. And shopping local. Shop local. And especially shopping local. Let's beat this virus. We can if we face it together. 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 For the latest information, visit oakgov.com forward slash COVID. Michigan, the coronavirus pandemic has put us all to the test. And now it's time to put COVID-19 to the test. As we move forward, testing will be critical. We encourage anyone who has reason to get tested to do so those with symptoms and those without. If you are leaving home and going back to work, get tested. If you think you may have COVID-19 or you've been exposed recently through family, friends, or coworkers, get tested. Our test locator tool can help you find the right testing site that fits your needs. Even if you're looking for easy access with no cost, no prescription, and no appointment necessary, we've got you covered. Help Michigan move forward not backward. To find a testing site or learn more, visit michigan.gov slash coronavirus test. A message from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. have you uh, tune in with us here on the Megacast. I'm Ronnie Dahl, Tyler Keith back there at the studios. Uh, right now, there is a big push for our high school students to be able to play their high school sports. And with us, more to talk a little bit more about this, Mark Hall, he's a board member for the Let Them Play organization. Mark, great to have you with us. Thanks for having us, or having me. So I, I know we went through this, this past um, fall, I think it was August or, or late summer. And here we are again. For people who maybe don't have kids playing uh, sports, bring us up to speed. Why are things shut down again? Um, the, the state, the uh, Michigan Department of Health and Human Services and the governor, um, you know, for the uh, COVID protection has determined that the contact sports uh, are shut down. Now this is our fifth reset. Um, for the winter sports uh, through the state. So we have volleyball, basketball, wrestling right now are stagnant. Uh, the, the kids haven't competed once and we are moving into February 8th for wrestling to start. Uh, my two sons are both uh, wrestlers. And so we're looking at uh, February 8th possibly as a reset date. And uh, 
it's just uh, we're upset as parents because we want to make the decisions for our children. And it goes against the scientific data that we're privy to that uh, this just isn't a risk for these kids. I feel like this time more so than the previous push to get the kids playing again has really picked up a lot of steam. You've had some pretty big people come out publicly to support your efforts. Um, Coach Campy, uh, you know, Dr. Vitti with the Detroit Public Schools. And these are people that um, are used to politics as well. But they are even coming out and saying these kids need to play because there is a mental health aspect to this as well. That's, that's giant. The mental health aspect is giant. Um, there's no avoiding that. Um, I was on the phone most of the day yesterday trying to get hold of the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services and just get some, um, some basic numbers on teen suicides for this past year. And I ran into a brick wall uh, through the state of Michigan, the, the, the most recent data we have on teen suicides is 2017. Um, tracking down through a uh, American Health Rankings, that, that it's an organization that looks at all causes of health issues in the United States. Um, we had a, uh, per 100,000, a 2.6 2. Uh, uh, children additional add-on uh, for 2020. It went from uh, 14.2 per 100,000 to 16.8 per 100,000, uh, which is the biggest spike that I could find of any year, more than double the biggest spike of any year. And I might add that the national fatality rate for children ages 15 through 25, high school to college age, is 1.2 uh, per 100,000 for COVID. So our children uh, 15 to 24 are at more than twice the risk of suicide than they are from COVID. And a university or a Georgia university did a study and found that children that participate in uh, competitive athletics uh, come down with COVID at a far, far less rate than children that don't participate in competitive sports because these children are aware of their um, team's reliability upon them. And so therefore they take the precautions statistically more serious than the average kid does. They don't wanna let their teammates down. Um, through the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services, uh, using their own stats, when we were doing three times a week testing for our athletes in the fall, we had a 99.98% negative testing. I mean, we can do this safely and we can minimize the far greater risk of suicide to these kids than COVID poses. Um, the suicide rate has climbed dramatically over the past year. And that has to do with a lot of these shutdowns. And, and my son, one of my sons is a senior. And we have uh, letters from NCAA coaches out of state that are saying that they aren't looking at our kids. There's nothing to look at. They aren't competing. Scholarships are slipping away from these kids every single day that we are not competing. Um, and so those are opportunities that are a very, very narrow window for these kids to further their, to set their life on the course that they want it to go. These are young people that are looking to, you know, set themselves up for their adult life. And these college scholarships, which some kids, it's the only thing that will be availed to them for a higher education. And those are going away by the day. And universities out of the state aren't even looking at our kids any longer. Yeah, we should point out that um, most states are back open for sports. Um, Michigan, I believe, is what, one of three that's not allowing high school sports. So what's happening too, some parents are deciding to go across state lines. Uh, I think I read an article about the Catholic schools saying, we just may lead the league and go over to Ohio and start playing because of some of the reasons that you just stated. The window is very narrow for some of these students uh, and their athletes and their ability to, and the possibility for them to get some of these scholarships. Absolutely, I mean, and, and those are realistic options for some people, not for others. And, you know, we're not naive. I, I, I'm not dumb. I don't, I don't ignore what's in front of me. Yes, COVID is serious. We have to take it serious. People with health conditions must take this very seriously. It could be deadly, 
But when we look at the facts and look at the studies and we find that, you know, the mental health issues that this uh, uh, shutdowns and lockdowns and keeping these kids out of sports is causing is putting these kids at this age bracket at a far greater risk than COVID poses to them. So our, I, we're to a point where the cure is worse than the disease. I will say I was very impressed and proud of so many of these high school athletes that took it very seriously and they didn't go out and go to parties because they were concerned about them being the one to get COVID and then stopping play for their entire team. And I will say, I think for so many of these teams, their couch, their you know coaches are very proud of them, but we as the general public should be um, pretty proud of these kids as well. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, these kids, you know, they, they enjoy the sports. It, you know, provides a, you know, a camaraderie, a teamship, a companionship and opportunities for their lives. And, and, you know, when you get to these high school levels and some of these schools, it's extremely competitive and very serious. And, you know, it's funny to, to watch my boys during football, you know, the team was self-policing. They, they, they were watching what each other was doing and had each other's backs for the good of the team because if a kid came down with COVID, the team was out. And so, you know, they, I can see where the, the numbers support that these kids in athletics are actually at lesser risk of catching it because of their self-policing. They don't even need mom and dad to be yelling at them. They're doing it themselves. And it probably means more when it comes from one of your uh, playmates uh, or your, your teammates, uh, <laughs> rather your teammates, <laughs> rather than an adult. It's like, yeah, hey, you know, mom and dad is being dumb, you know, sit down and shut up, mom. Right. Uh, but with that, you guys were here before. Um, you're yeah. back at this point. So what happened the last time did you learn from that you're going to do differently this time to try to end some of these closures? You know, it's just, you know, organizing better. You know, when we came to the table in August and went to the Capitol and, you know, pleaded with the governor and we got the, the, the fall sports open, you know, we proved, we proved to everybody that we could do it. I, I don't believe there is one known uh, transmission of COVID from sports, from athletic competition. And, and we've proven that we can do it and we can do it safely. No child died from these sports due to COVID. And it's like, so now we, we just want the governor and the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services, her appointees to listen to us and to listen to what, you know, we're doing. We're not gonna, you know, risk, put our children at risk unduly. And uh, uh, so we're just organizing, uh, you know, seeking some legal remedies and uh, expanding our, our uh, message, you know, from a multitude of uh, demographics throughout our state. So we've seen other entities, the restaurant industry, the bowling alleys, there's been so many other entities that have tried to take this issue, issue of closures uh, through the court system, and they have not been successful most of the time. Why do you think your case in this case could be different? We're not confident we're going to be successful, but we want to be heard. And we want a legal opinion on this. We want to bring light to it. And so um, for our kids, we have to do everything that we can to provide them the best opportunities in their life, sitting back and, and you know, hoping that other people have their best interest at heart uh, isn't what a good parent does. And so with that, Mark Hall with us here on the Megacast, he's a board member for Let Them Play. The group is uh, organizing a rally to be held this Saturday in Lansing at noon to try to get the Whitmer administration to allow for contact sports in the high schools to resume uh, here. What date are you guys trying to get to, Mark? Uh, as soon as possible. Um, you know, uh, like we say right now, uh, some of the sports are early February. Uh, wrestling right now is the, the last one that they're going to revisit on February 8th. But, I, we, you know, we've five times though, we've had the, the clock reset on this for winter sports. And uh, we're not confident that, uh, um, you know, they'll, they will allow that to happen. So and that rally, anybody that wants to come and support the kids and, and the athletes in this state, we welcome them. Um, it's not a political rally. We don't want any political signs. We you know, this is a message about our kids. If you want to bring your school banners and American flag, fantastic. But this isn't a Democrat or Republican or a libertarian issue. This is a family issue. 
Uh, but with that, you do have the support of the Republicans right now. They are pushing uh, to try to allow for, you know, these sports to resume. In fact, they want to start leaving it up to some of the local health departments. Now, the governor has kind of fought back and she says, you know, she's focusing on the metrics and sometimes it's the context that you have to take those metrics, not just the numbers. What do you guys say? Do you guys have any type of open line of communication with anyone and the Whitmer administration right now? No, um, we have some communications with the High School Athletic Association and uh, some of the uh, members of the state legislature. Um, uh, even the uh, High School Athletic Association has uh, uh, the, the, the governor's administration has been pretty much uh, uh, silent with them, uh, not providing much information. Um, just basically following their guide, demanding they follow their guidelines, the, the administration's guidelines. So um, the uh, uh, legislature has been more receptive to uh, uh, listening to us. And, and yes, uh, the Republicans are, are more amenable to uh, our views and thoughts on this. So it does seem um, the MHSAA, I believe I saw an article with their president, he said at least the new uh, director for the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services, they seem to be starting to open up some dialogue. But, uh, you know, a lot of people were taken off guard with this announcement. Did anyone within your organization or anyone that you've talked to have any clue that this was going to be coming down the pipelines? The I'm sorry, what, what was the, coming the stoppage down the that the stoppage was coming down the pipeline because in oh. one breath, I think everyone lost focus when the Whitmer administration uh, when they made the announcement because everyone was focused on the fact that the restaurants were going to be allowed to reopen on the first of February, and then it was like everyone forgot the rest of that press conference and what was said during it. Right. I mean, it, it, it was it was devastating when we got that information. You know, we when they opened up football, we were. Um, you know, the, the contact sports, we were we were happy and, and success and kind of high fiving each other. And then again, like I say, this comes along and the rug gets pulled out from underneath you and it, it gets, uh, you know, it, it's it's um, um, kind of devastating. And, you know, the kids are, uh, you know, we, we have to try to get the kids out of their rooms, you know, and get them interactive just because they're withdrawing a little bit. And uh, um, just this week, they started going back to a hybrid uh, class schedule which is good, you know, uh, although it's only 50% of the students per day, um, they're having some interactions with their peers and I'm seeing an uptick in their, their, their mental uh, well-being. So that's, that's one positive. But, you know, they're, they're practicing, they're, they're, you know, they're trying to get prepared, but, you know, you, you don't know. And they, you tell the kid, okay, you, this date, you know, no, not this date, this date. And, you know, that happens four or five times. You know, how, how can we keep telling them to be positive and optimistic when you keep doing this to them. I mean, it's, 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 it's bad. Well, and the dates have been so fluid. I think right. it was what way back in November when she shut down the restaurants and said three weeks ended up being what closer to three months. And I think that's been the hard thing for so many people uh, throughout this pandemic. But do you also think, are you getting, um, do you think she's sending mixed messages by allowing restaurants to reopen and pushing for schools to go back to in-person learning, but at the same time saying no to uh, high school sports? And the Red Wings are playing and, you know, the NFL is playing and, uh, you know, I sit back and scratch my head. I, I, I don't understand it. I can't explain it to my kids. I, I uh, you know, I I understand the overall, the overarching uh, theory is, you know, to protect people. Um, but you had, like you say, when you have to, you, maybe you need to get a little deeper into the weeds and look at these numbers as far as where the risks are. And, uh, you know, NFL players are in a different age bracket. They, many of them, and they're at a greater risk than these kids at, at 15 to 24. So why are we shutting down these kids at 15 to 24, but yet we let pro athletes Play, how is that less risky for them? Because they're statistically at a greater risk from COVID than these uh, young athletes. So it, it, it's, it's, yeah, it's hard to wrap my head around uh, uh, the thought processes that are coming out of Lansing. You know, I think you, you, you've, been to, you've been to some of these uh, large stores and where you can go in and shop for, uh, you know, and, and you scratch your head and, it, you know, then you can't go in and sit down in a, in a small restaurant. I, I don't get it. 
Yeah. Well, I will say, I remember um, I was at Home Goods, you know, getting a dog toy. I, I, I put it down. It was like, I'm not waiting in line. <laughs> it, the line, every time you go in there, it was like out the door. You're like, what? Is everyone just shopping now because they can't do anything else? Uh, and, and so then you wonder about some of these issues. But of course, the, the big concern right now has to do with the variant. And look what's happening at University of Michigan. They're telling right. the students, hey, you need to stay home. So I know that the variant is one of the reasons behind the governor making this decision. So do you understand um, kind of her argument in that regard? Oh, I don't I don't at, at, at all at any point in time totally dismiss her her thought processes. Um, I don't believe she's doing it to be vindictive or anything like that. I do believe she has the interest of the people. But we still have to remember this is the United States of America, you know, and we are a free people and we shouldn't have to ask for permissions. And I do believe that if if you're sick, if you're elderly, if there's health issues, we should be very cautious around those people, you know, grandparents. If you're not sure, stay away. If you're, you know, at, at risk, stay home. You know, get get people to deliver. My, you know, family, friends, call me. I'll deliver food to people. Leave it on your porch. But I'm not sure locking down healthy people is is necessarily the right thing to do. And it concerns me when we start looking at these numbers. That you know, like I said, with this age group, the suicide is a much greater risk to these people, young people, than COVID is when we look at the, the actual numbers. It, but, when, you know, Mark, when we go back to the fall, it was stop, start, stop, start. It was so confusing. Are you concerned if they do give the green light, you're going to run into the same situation for the winter sports season as well? I I am fearful of that. I, I mean, it and yeah, it's 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 a high and a low. You know, you, you get high, you get you get your hopes up, and then again, you know, uh, it's not going to happen. It's happening. It's not going to happen. And and I'm an adult, and it's disappointing for me. What about these kids? And again, you know, I go back to you know their futures. This this isn't just about playing a game. This has a lot to do with you know setting them up as as uh, uh, fine young adults to understand the greater good for the group. Uh, you know, uh, teamwork. Uh, uh, sometimes I have to sit on the sidelines so, you know, other team members can get in there. So there's a lot of life lessons that go into athletics, as well as the opportunities and the doors that open for them in their future. And every day that door remains closed is an opportunity gone that will never come back. So, uh, Mark, can you talk a little bit about the plans for the lawsuit? It, it hasn't actually been filed yet, right? No, it has not. So what is that process? Are you hoping to open up the line of communication prior to having to go that route? I think that's a lot of, of everything that we're doing is to get the communication open, to let the parents be heard, to you know look at some alternative uh, numbers out there to, you know, when you look at the overreaching numbers and the amount of COVID deaths, yes, it's scary. But when we break it down, Let's, let's listen to us, listen to the parents, listen to uh, the CDC. And, uh, uh, you know, so it's kind of, I guess, I guess a, a uh, uh, multi-front attack. I guess I shouldn't say attack, but a multi-front uh, 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 address to the uh, uh, governor's administration to look at it from our perspective uh, rather than just a, a you know, a, you know, a single dimensional uh, uh, approach. So I know you guys have a Facebook page, um, but if people want to join in or even just to find out more information about um, some of the information you've shared here and your argument for trying to restart some of these sports, where can they find that? Oh, the Facebook would be uh, Let Them Play. Um, if, all over Twitter, if they do the hashtag Let Them Play. Um, and that, I guess those would be the two main uh, locations uh, um, trending all over Twitter. A lot of teams are doing videos uh, pleading to the governor um, and the, the health department and then uh, or just to simply show up at the uh, state capitol Saturday at noon if you can come out and help support us. With that, how important has it been for you to have some of these big names or people with influence too to support your cause this time around? 
I think it I think it adds credibility that we're just uh, you know you hear you're just irrational parents you know you're just uh, all about sports and no you know we love our children we want the best for our children we care about our children's health and so when you bring bring in some of these uh, big names and we have clergy members doctors uh, you know uh, uh, coaches athletic directors uh, the superintendent of uh, many of the school districts that you know. It, our message is being heard and it's being supported by people that that aren't just necessarily parents that are, you know, uh, don't really have a dog, so to speak, in the fight, that uh, they do believe that it is probably the, the, the best way to go for the kids and their futures. Well, Mark Hall, we wish you guys luck uh, this Saturday again at noon at the Capitol building there in Lansing, the Let Them Play rally. Mark, thanks for your time. We so appreciate it. Thank you very much for hearing me out. We greatly appreciate the attention. The students, uh, boy, it has been such a tough time for so many of these students. So, you know, a lot of people are making the argument just like you as a parent, but also their teachers and their coaches that some of these students desperately need uh, this because it goes beyond just playing a sport. It's more about their mental uh, health as well. So Mark, thank you. We always appreciate your time. We're going to take a quick break here on the Megacast. When we come back, we'll be speaking with the program manager for the Clinton River Watershed Council. This is the Oakland County Megacast. Perry tested positive for COVID-19. Emma was exposed to a friend who's positive. Willa's waiting on test results. After any contact with COVID-19, or if you test positive, stay home for at least 10 days. If you live with others, keep your distance and wear a mask. Help Michigan contain COVID-19. Visit michigan.gov slash contain COVID. Hi, my name is Kurt Lawson, and I'm the Public Information Officer for West Bloomfield Township. We wanted to reach out to you, our older adults, to provide information that you may find useful during this difficult time. We want to ensure you that West Bloomfield Town Hall, our Waters and Utility Department, West Bloomfield Parks, and our Police and Fire Departments continue to work hard on your behalf. Information and resources can be found on the Township website, the Police Facebook and Twitter, or call West Bloomfield Parks COVID-19 Help Hotline. Please remember to keep your social distance of at least six feet Wear facial coverings when you leave your home and wash your hands for at least 20 seconds with soap. These precautions will help keep you safe during these difficult times. As rivals, we don't always see eye to eye. Like who scored the best recruits? Who's gonna be who? And whether we wear green or blue. But one thing we can all agree on to help stop the spread of COVID-19. Wear a mask. 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 The ball's in your court, Michigan. Michigan, we still need to stay careful because we don't want to go backwards. Back to where we started. So keep standing six feet apart. Keep wearing a mask in public. And if you have symptoms, talk to a healthcare provider about getting tested. To move forward, let's all do our part. So stay careful. Michigan.gov slash coronavirus. Hi, I'm Dr. Faust, the medical director for the Oakland County Health Division. The most important thing you can do to prevent the spread of illness is to wash your hands thoroughly and often. Follow these six easy steps every time you wash your hands. Step one. Turn on the sink and wet your hands with warm water. Step two, apply soap to your hands and lather between your fingers, under your nails, and the front and back of your hands and wrists. Step three, wash your hands by scrubbing them together for at least 20 seconds. Step four, rinse your hands with warm, clean water. And step five, dry your hands with a clean cloth towel, a paper towel, or hot air blow dryer. If you're using a cloth towel, make sure to change it often. For handheld faucets, turn off the water using a paper towel instead of your bare hand. Step six, if you're using a paper towel, throw it away. Practice healthy habits like washing your hands after coughing or sneezing into them to keep you and others healthy. Go to oakgov.com health or call Nurse on Call at 1-800-848-5533 to learn more. Welcome 
Welcome back to the Megacast. Just about 20 minutes here left in the show, and we want to end the show with speaking to Kathleen Sexton. She's the program manager over at the Clinton River Watershed Council. Great to see you again. Happy New Year. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Happy New Year to you also. I learned so much the last time um, we talked about the Clinton River Watershed Council on the show, but for those that maybe missed that episode, give us a little bit of background about what you actually do. Sure. So the Clinton River Watershed Council, we are a nonprofit organization. Our office is based in Rochester Hills, but we have a pretty large service area. We cover 760 square miles in Southeast Michigan. So everything within the watershed boundary. And so a watershed is essentially just an area of land where all of the water resources in that specific area drain to a common body of water. So we're talking about the Clinton River, its tributaries and Lake St. Clair. So we work to protect, enhance and celebrate the Clinton River, its watershed and Lake St. Clair. I was, you answered so many of my questions already. I was about to say, what is a watershed? <laughs> and you're, okay. uh, so it's great, you know, because there are so many people out there. We don't understand exactly uh, the boundaries. Like if I live in um, Kiko Harbor, why should I care about this? So Kiko Harbor has a lot of water resources. We've got Cass Lake, Sylvan Lake, Dollar Lake, um, and even Oakland County and Macomb County and in general, because we have lots of Oakland, Macomb County within our watershed, as well as parts of um, St. Clair, Lapeer, and Wayne County. So like I said, it's a pretty big service area, but in Michigan in general, we have so many freshwater resources and we want to know um, how we protect them, how we restore them, and then what we can do ourselves in order to be part of that restoration process. So what is the biggest threat that you're concerned about right now, Kathleen? So right now, the biggest thing that affects the water quality in the Clinton River is stormwater pollution, which it's kind of a hard issue to tackle because it's a collective issue. It's a result of everybody's individual behaviors. So when it rains or when snow melts and that water runs across roads or driveways or roofs, it picks up everything um, that's on those surfaces. So right now, we can imagine there's a lot of road salt in that runoff. There's litter in that runoff, oil and grease, things like that. And it ends up in our rivers and streams untreated because they go into the storm drains. They're not treated at a waste, that, that water is not treated at a wastewater treatment plant before it hits the river. So if we can keep those uh, pollutants out, it helps keep our streams a lot healthier and cleaner. But how do we do that? So we have several different programs that we can educate homeowners on what they can do at home. So things like green infrastructure, you can add a rain garden, which a rain garden sounds it sounds confusing, but it's essentially just mimicking a wetland. So adding a couple of plants, you know, digging a little bit, a little bowl, adding some plants at home um, that'll help absorb some of that stormwater, making sure that you're taking good care of your vehicle, making sure that you're maybe getting some elbow grease out there and, you know, shoveling the snow instead of salting the ground, you know, things that you can remove manually first um, instead of using chemicals or salt. Um, when you're fertilizing in the spring or the fall, being aware of reading the package, making sure that you're um, applying fertilizer with uh, in accordance with the directions and not over fertilizing, because anything that's excess will end up uh, washing off into the river. So there really are a lot of little steps that everyone can do to protect yeah. our environment and we just don't think about it. Right, because we have one and a half million people living within the watershed. So if even, you know, just half of those people made small steps at home, it really would make a big difference collectively. So if someone wants to get involved in your program, do you, are you guys taking volunteers right now with COVID and the pandemic going on? We are doing um, some volunteer events. We actually have an event coming up this weekend. Um, everything is outdoors, socially distanced with a mask, and we also have some programs that are virtual right now. So the, the event that's coming up this weekend is called Stonefly Search. So tell us more about that. What is so, a stonefly? So <laughs> I guess we stone, can start there, huh? <laughs> yeah, we could start there. Um, a stonefly is a small aquatic insect, um, and there's two species that actually emerge in the winter to avoid predation. Um, they're just like a mosquito or a regular fly. So they start their life cycle in the water and then they eventually emerge and become a flying insect. Stoneflies are very sensitive to pollution, which means that they are a good indicator of water quality. 
So we get volunteers, we train them how to collect them, we train them on how to identify them and record the data and they go out all across the watershed. We've got about 75 people going out. Um, they look for stoneflies, they come back and tell us what we found with their data sheets and then we've been collecting that data for almost 20 years now. So it really helps us keep an eye on the watershed, if there's any changes, improvements, things like that. And what have you been able to discover from this over the 20 years? Well, I mean, we're actually coming up to our 50th anniversary this year. At the end of the year, we're going to be celebrating that. So, I mean, 50 years ago, you wouldn't be able to find fish in certain parts of the river. And now it's a really popular fishing spot. Um, there's all kinds of life. Lake St. Clair is really popular for bass fishing and things like that. And stoneflies are a very significant food source for fish. So when we find more stoneflies, it supports the ecosystem. We've got clean water and it helps support fish populations and other uh, wildlife populations. It really is fascinating to think about how nature works together. And it yeah. is a full circle. Do you think during the pandemic, we know that so many more people were getting, they were taking advantage of our backyards and our, you know, our streams, our rivers, our lakes and our trails. Do you think that that's going to have a long lasting um, positive impact on our environment because people are enjoying it more? I would hope so. And I think I think that yes, it will. I think that part of what we do is we educate people about, you know, the things that are happening, like the water quality issues, but we also educate people about what's good. So part of our mission is celebration. So we celebrate these water resources and we try to develop a sense of appreciation and stewardship. So people are excited that, that we have all these resources to get outside these, um, these public lands, um, the rivers and streams and lakes. And hopefully if they are using them and appreciating them, they'll also want to take care of them. So uh, the Watershed is a nonprofit. How do you guys um, get your funding? Is it through government agencies or is it donations? So it's a variety, both of those that you just mentioned. So we, we do have some stormwater and government memberships. We work with communities in order to provide education services to their constituents that live in their community. We also um, get grants from community foundations. We also apply for grants from the state or federal organizations. Um, but donations are, and memberships are a big part of it too. So if people want to get involved either by volunteering or becoming a member, they can go to our website. It's crwc.org. Or you can sign up for our newsletter. So um, any opportunities that are coming up for education, volunteering, or becoming a member, you'll get updates about that there. Kathleen Sexton with us here on the Mega Cash. She's the program manager for the Clinton River Watershed Council. Uh, Kathleen, you you seem you appear to be so young, but you're so knowledgeable. How did you get into this? I would say that my uh, sense of wanting to take care of nature and the environment and things like that really was instilled when I was a young kid. I remember playing a lot outside. I remember being curious about, you know, wildlife and water and how everything worked. And, um, you know, just different things in my life that point, pointed me in this direction. I got my undergraduate degree in natural resources management. Um, I had a few different positions that kind of steered me to where I wanted to be. And I was lucky enough to, you know, be able to work for this amazing organization that's close to where I grew up. Um, so it's really come full circle for me, but I would say a lot of the stem from, you know, when I was a kid and playing outside and, and hearing about in the nineties, the big buzzword was acid rain, you know, so what is that and why is it bad? And, and it just continued from there. But when I'm thinking about the public, it's easy to get people behind supporting like panda bears or giraffes or some of these other um, cute animals. And not yeah. that the stone fly isn't cute, but really, I mean, how do you get people excited um, to support what the work that you're doing? So that is a good point because I, I do have some pictures of the stone flies. They aren't, um, they aren't particularly cute looking, but um, I see this a lot when we work with our high school and middle school students too. They're kind of like, ooh, those are gross or, oh, that looks weird. And you just get them excited about, oh, this is science. You're able to do some science. You're helping us collect this data. Um, and it's actually pretty cool. And then they kind of come around to that like, wow, it is kind of cool. 
And I think it's also um, empowering people to do their own science. So citizen science, that's what it's about. It's about educating just regular citizens um, about how they can do this and how they can be a part of collecting this data. And then especially when they come back every year and see how it's changed or see how it's getting better. Um, I think that's really important to get people involved and, and get people um, engaged and sort of bought into the mission. Uh, you know, it, it, it is sad though, what's happening uh, in our environment in so many different places as well, especially when you see uh, the amount of trash that's in our oceans. And, mm -hmm. you know, even now it's like you go out and you see people throwing their gloves down still, or their face mask still, almost daily, I'm still seeing a mask. Um, you know, in the, in the driveway or, you know, in the parking lot or something of that nature. And so do you, are you hopeful that our environment is going to survive or do you also get discouraged because you're doing all of this work and there people are still disrespecting mother nature? Yeah, that is a very good question. Um, I, I am hopeful. I do think that there's certain people that just, they, they, decided to litter and they're, they're going to continue to do that. But there's a lot of people that can change. And I try to stay away from the doom and gloom messaging. It's always like, oh, this is bad or the environment's bad. But, you know, 50 years ago, the river was in really bad shape and it's it's improved so much now. And I fully believe that 50 years from now, it'll be better than where it is today. Yeah. I mean, look at the Rouge River. Yeah. You know, there are parts in Detroit, you, like you wouldn't even want to put your finger in there. And yeah. now you can fish in it. The fish are returning to the, you know, Rouge River and Detroit. Yeah. Who would ever have thought that even 10, 15 years ago, right? Yeah. Yeah. So we work closely with Friends of the Rouge. They're a uh, other watershed group. Um, they've been doing a lot of great things. They've got a paddling trail. They've got a rain garden program. So lots of opportunities in that in that area, too. Um, we do work closely with other watershed groups because watershed boundaries um, are dictated by, you know, geography and geological features, but municipal boundaries are not. So, for example, West Bloomfield is in a very um, unique area because it has parts of the Rouge River watershed, the Clinton River watershed, and the Huron River watershed, all within one township. Wow. So with that, if someone wants to get involved or if they want to volunteer, how can they do that? Like I said, you guys can uh, go to our website, www.crwc.org, and we have all of our events and volunteer opportunities listed there. You're also welcome to sign up for our newsletter. And um, there's maps so you can see which watershed you're in. So if you're not necessarily in the Clinton, but you wanna get involved, you're still welcome to volunteer with us, or you can check out um, the Rouge River Watershed or the Huron River Watershed Council. They also have um, similar programs and opportunities as well. So are you able to share those um, pictures with us of the stonefly? Yeah. I can share you share some pictures of the stonefly with you guys right now. And I'll talk to you a little bit about the morphology and and what we look for and how to identify them. So um, they are a little interesting looking. If you look, the biggest identifier for a stonefly is the two tails and then their triangular thorax here. And then if you look over on this side of the screen, this is a dragonfly larvae. So dragonfly also spend most of their life cycle in the water and they, they're much larger. So you can see that the, the winter stoneflies that we look for are pretty small. Um, they're tiny little insects, but they, they make a big impact and they indicate clean water. So that's why we like to find them. So can you see them with the naked eye or do you need like a net to be able to go in and fish and try to find them? So we do take a net, we take a D net, we put it on the bottom of the river, you're in waders. I've got some pictures of some volunteers and waders. Let's see if I can pull it up. Yep, so this is pictures of volunteers actually getting in the river and collecting the bugs. We put them in the bins. You can see them with the naked eye, um, but we have a, a field microscope which just micro or magnifies about 10 times and that can help you see it, them a little more close up. I will say uh, kudos to the volunteers because it's not warm <laughs> this time of year, you know? Yeah, I think it was two years ago. We went out when it was about five degrees. So, and everybody was still willing to do it. They were excited. You just, you, we bundled up and once you had the water in your bins, you had to look very quick, quickly for the bugs before it froze. <laughs> so it, you definitely want some hand warmers and some tote warmers. Yes. Absolutely. And some brave people that are willing to put on the waders and get in the river. 
Uh, Kathleen uh, Sexton with us here. She's the program manager for the Clinton River Watershed Council. Kathleen, before we let you go, anything else maybe I didn't touch on that you want to share? Yeah, absolutely. I will share one thing. Um, today, we are going to be celebrating our 50th anniversary this year. And we actually um, were established in December of 1971. So we're going to be starting promoting that this spring. And then a lot of our events that are surrounding our 50th anniversary fundraising events um, outdoor events are going to be happening towards the later part of the year, but stay tuned. If you haven't heard of us before, this year is a great time to get involved and we'd love to have more support and more volunteers. So when we talk about the volunteers, I noticed in the pictures, it appeared they were mostly adults. Do you allow kids to volunteer as well? We do. This is a family friendly event. So um, kids of all ages are welcome. Same thing with our cleanups. We have our weekly clean program that I'll be starting back in uh, early April. So family friendly event. These pictures are, I think, from last year in January. So before pre pandemic, we are requiring masks, we are requiring social distancing from anybody outside of your household. But they are outdoor events. So relatively safe when it comes to uh, the pandemic and things like that. Well, Kathleen, it's been great to uh, have you on the show. I always learn so much um, when you guys come on. Yeah, thank you so much. Thanks for having me. And uh, good luck with those volunteers. I'll be here Thank drinking you. cocoa, but I'll look for you to post the pictures. Sounds good. <laughs> We're going to take a quick break here on the Megacast. Michigan, the coronavirus pandemic has put us all to the test. And now it's time to put COVID-19 to the test. As we move forward, testing will be critical. We encourage anyone who has reason to get tested to do so, those with symptoms and those without. If you are leaving home and going back to work, get tested. If you think you may have COVID-19 or you've been exposed recently through family, friends, or coworkers, get tested. Our test locator tool can help you find the right testing site that fits your needs. Even if you're looking for easy access with no cost, no prescription, and no appointment necessary, We've got you covered. Help Michigan move forward, not backward. To find a testing site or learn more, visit michigan.gov slash coronavirus test. A message from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. Just a few more minutes here uh, on the Thursday edition of the Oakland County Megacast. Tyler, I have to tell you, it's hard to get excited about the stonefly when you see the pictures. So bless their hearts and kudos to them because Mother Nature is amazing. And we really need passionate people such as Kathleen and the volunteers to go out there and uh, make our earth a better earth. Yeah, yeah it, it is really interesting getting a perspective on these scientific facts on, on stuff like the stonefly, which is not really something that a lot of people are clamoring to learn more about uh, from someone that knows what they're talking about who can actually present it in an interesting way. I feel bad, like if you would have said, hey, we need volunteers to come out and, you know, help with the giraffe or feed the elephants or, you know, something of that nature, I've been like raising my hand. I would have been out there, but uh, kudos to them because it's also cold. Uh, but it is a full circle, this world that we live in, and we need all aspects to continue that full circle. So it was great to have her on with us here on the Megacast. I uh, just want to remind people again, if you want to catch any of the interviews, if you missed one of the interviews, you want to learn more uh, about the Let Them Play organization and what they're trying to do uh, and the rally they have coming up this Saturday, those interviews will be posted a little bit later today on Civic Center TV. And you can also go on our, our website to be able to find um, previous interviews and full Megacast too, going all the way back mm -hmm. to this past March when uh, Tyler and Dave Scott started this uh, show. Yes, yeah, you can find all that on our website, uh, short interviews, clips with some of the most important information and of course, full episodes, if you're not able to tune in for the full thing and you want to watch them, they're on demand right there on our page. And just on that note with the Let Them Play rally, going to that page, you do, unfortunately, 
see a lot of very negative, very abrasive, borderline, and sometimes very much so, hate speech on there. And having heard what Mark said on our show today, that's not what their message is all about. That's not what they're trying to get across. This is for the families. This is for the kids. If you're going to go to that site, keep it peaceful. And you have some, if you don't have something nice to say, it's something productive to say. If you don't have something nice to say, it's fine to be frustrated. It's fine to be angry at your government officials. They work for us. But and keep, keep, it, keep it at least cordial. Keep it professional. And, and don't be a jerk. Because that only takes away from the actual message that they're trying to get across and the work that they're trying to do. Good advice. Thank you. If you don't have something nice to say, don't say it and don't be a jerk. And with that, we're going to wrap up the Thursday edition of the Megacast.